God, you have called us here to this place today. You have gathered us in as your people. You have enlightened us with your gifts. Use this time, this morning, to again instill in us a sense that we have been anointed by your Holy Spirit, sent into battle that belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is great to be here with you this morning to see uh, so many familiar faces here at St. John. And as I look out, and I think I said this the last time, I look out and you're still in the same pews, <laughs> the same spots. I can identify each family from where they are. Your kids are a little bit bigger from when we started Cypress Chapel. Change is good. It's okay to get a different perspective. And I hope that after this morning, you have a different perspective on what God is calling us to do. Again, for those of you who, who don't know me and haven't ever heard me preach before, my name is Pastor Stephen Mick. I've been uh, deployed with uh, Cypress Chapel down the street at Creekwood Grill for the last six years now. Uh, we launched that in 2016. And I'm thankful that God has allowed me to come here. I was actually the last pastor they called to come and preach today. <laughs> it happens to be because I was the, the last one to say yes, but they didn't keep calling after I said, yes, I can preach. But I'm thankful to be with you today because this continuation in this series of anointed uh, flows perfectly from what you all were talking about last week with Pentecost that God called us and called the disciples initially, and he was, he was with the disciples in that upper room in Jerusalem during the celebration of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came upon the disciples' head like tongues of fire, and they were called individually as followers of Jesus and sent out, speaking in different tongues and languages for God's glory. The continuation of that story is that we're not only called as individuals, that, that God sees each and every person in this room from the smallest child to the, the most aged and seasoned individual, but he also collectively calls us as one people, one body together. It's not simply an individual calling that we have, but also collectively as a church that we have been anointed and in those early years, it was very difficult for the church to get together because they were being persecuted. It was very difficult uh, for things all to happen in, uh, in simplicity. They, they didn't have big sanctuaries like this. They were gathering in each other's homes, and they were pulled apart. They were rejected by their families because they were following this new regime of Jesus of Nazareth. But over 2,000 years, God has established his church on earth. And it is this church that we celebrate today. We often say when we speak the words of the Apostles' Creed that the Holy Spirit has called us in as the people of God. And has, has called us in. And Martin Luther says the Holy Spirit not only has called us in, but also the Holy Spirit has calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. So this description of being a part of the church, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. What does it mean to be a part of the church and to see God flowing from this? So to start out, what does it mean to be called by the gospel? Some of you can remember the initial time in which you were called by the gospel, and it might have been from an early age. Maybe your parents were already bringing you in to attend worship on a regular basis. Some of you came to faith at a different point in life. Maybe it was a neighbor who brought you in and invited you to their church. Maybe it was your spouse that said, hey, if we're going to get married, we've got to do this, this God thing together. But you have been called in, and the Holy Spirit has done this, and this is made clear by the words of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesian church, where he said, you're different now. You're going to act different. You're going to speak differently because this is for God's glory. And he says to the church there, so then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone 
in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Now, some of us remember when this sanctuary was built in 2010, 2011, our first worship service. Was anybody here on that New Year's Eve? We are sitting on lawn chairs, on concrete, and gathering here on New Year's Eve 2011, or 2010 into 2011, saying, what is God going to use this space for? And there's a cornerstone of the worship center. If you go out these double doors uh, on your way to the chapel parking lot, you'll see a cornerstone that says, to God be the glory. That we have been built together. This space has been built for God's purpose. Built on Christ Jesus, the cornerstone. And Paul continues and says, In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You individually are coming together from God the Spirit. That's a beautiful thing. It's being a part of a, a bigger team. The description we had earlier at the, at the children's message was that if you were an individual who wanted to play the tuba, anybody play the tuba out here? All right, there we go. Do you want to be a one-man band playing the tuba? Maybe. <laughs> now, if I would ask who plays the trumpet, who plays the trumpet or the flute? Yeah, you have a little bit different mentality. Like, you know, I could be a band by myself. I play the trumpet. I play the flute. I'm a violin aficionado. Tuba, I'm a trombonist. You got to be a part of a band. The same thing is true with the church. We don't want to be just an individual a missionary all by themselves. Even when the missionaries, those first apostles were sent out, they were sent two by two by Jesus himself in Luke's gospel, but also then into the book of Acts. They were sent out in pairs, Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas. Sometimes they got along, sometimes they had to separate because they had some frustrating moments. But they were never alone. And we've been called to be a part of this bigger church of God. Not only does God call us, but also he gathers us in. He gathers us here in this place together. We also gather in various spots, and in Hebrews chapter 10, we hear this because sometimes the church didn't want to gather. And so as the writers of the Hebrews says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Think back 2,000 years, trying to gather in people's homes, and then the authorities would come and knock on the door and say, you can't do this. This is against the law. You can't worship in this way. You can't gather in this way. You can't share in this way. Your taxes will all need to go, continue to go to Caesar. You have to worship only at the temple in Jerusalem. How frustrating, how hard that would be. And so the church, the people of God, stopped gathering together. And the writer to the Hebrews says, you can't do this. We must continue. We must persevere. We must uh, continue in this thought that we are gathering together in God's name. I just lost something. Uh, let me get it. I know Pastor Mark and Pastor Jeff don't usually use these, and this is why. <laughs> sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But we gather together in God's name to encourage each other. How many of you liked COVID? No. If you liked COVID and you want to raise your hand special in confidential counseling after worship, we can do that. COVID was hard. It was exhausting. Not just for the sickness that took loved ones away from us, but for the separation that we had from our family, from our friends, from our schools, from our neighbors, that we were unable to see people that we loved. And maybe that's still true for you today because of divisions that happened through COVID. Maybe you didn't see eye to eye on how the, the government should be handling it or how the authorities required or restricted us in certain ways. 
and you lost friendships, or you've separated from loved ones and family because of it. But we as people long to be together. We as the church long to be together. We want to be in this space. We want that, that we glorified and we gave praise and honor to God when we built over a decade ago. We don't want to have big buildings that go empty and vacant. We long to gather. But we don't do so just because we like getting together and eating food and, and talking about our lives. We do so because we are the people of God who have also then been enlightened in the faith. And this is a, a kind of a strange term. We think of enlightenment, the age of enlightenment, when, when people started to see things in new ways, uh, when, when people realized that there, there was more that they could do intellectually than maybe they were limiting themselves in the past. And I'm not saying, and Martin Luther was not saying that we are more intelligent than other people. We're not smarter. We don't have everything right because we know, as we said earlier in the service, we are sinful and we get things wrong. But we are enlightened in such that when we do get together, it is for a purpose. When we get together, it's to pray for one another. When we get together, it's to encourage one another. When we get together, it's so that God can pour into us collectively as his people. And I love this description in John chapter 10. And this comes from the larger text. This is the I am the good shepherd section of John's gospel. And if you've been here at St. John for a number of years, you, know, you remember John 10.10 10 was the, the key verse for us as a congregation. For I have come to give life and to give it in abundance or abundantly. They couldn't do that at the first service. You all are, are better than them. <laughs> Don't tell them that, though. If you're watching from the first service, you got it right. Jesus is saying, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that I might give life and give it in abundance or give it abundantly. That is what this, 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 this dialogue from John 10 is saying. But then Jesus himself says this, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them in also. And when they listen to my voice, so there will be one flock and one shepherd. He's gathering us in, not just so that we can go from place to place, but he's gathering us in so that we find that fertile soil and we find that, that grass that we need to receive. He's gathering us in so that it keeps us safe from the enemies, from the thieves that try to steal and kill and destroy those who are a part of the church. We're not on our own. But Jesus gathers us into the fold. And when we get together... When the Holy Spirit calls and gathers us and enlightens us, we do things differently. This last week, I, I always start out on Sunday, and I think I have a, a picture of what the week's going to look like, and maybe you've done this too, that you have everything planned out for the week of Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. It gets a little crazy in the summer because there's a little bit more ups and downs. There's not school and specific activities. But last Sunday, I thought I had a picture of what last week was going to look like. And then Monday morning happened. Has that ever happened to you? Like, this isn't any of what I was expecting to do. Last Monday morning, I got a call from Dana Bond, Pastor Bond's daughter-in-law, who is the president of the PTO at Farney Elementary School. And she said, there's been enough talk among the leaders at the school, the administration, and also the parents, that we would like to do something for the Collins family. We prayed for the Collins family this morning. You may have heard about the tragedy that struck their grandfather and his four grandsons a week and a half ago. And their sons attended Farney Elementary. And Misty Collins, the mom who lost three sons, is a fifth grade teacher. And so Dana and I were talking on the phone, and she said, can you at all help with a prayer vigil at Farney on Monday night? So any plans I thought I had for Monday were completely thrown out of the window, but that was what God was calling me to do and be a part of. And so we pulled together a sound system. We pulled together a set list of what needed to happen. We, we had prayers. We had some scripture readings. We had uh, some songs all ready to go. And we gathered on the front lawn at Farney Elementary. This is a public elementary school in Cy Fair Independent School District. The administration could not be a part of it officially 
but they were there. I don't know if you've attended vigils at all for difficult situations, but I can tell you this on public school grounds, on public property for one of our schools in the community, it was certainly a called, gathered, and enlightened group of people who were there led by community leaders, led by pastors, led by worship leaders. We sang, we prayed, we cried. And the people there did not leave that prayer vigil without hope. I've been to other community gatherings where it was really a, a recollection of the people who have died. People get up, they talk for a little bit, and they say, well, I love this person, they did this and this and this, and they were great at this, but now we're going to miss them forever, and we're really sad. But at this gathering, there were tears shed. But we had hope. The focus was not on the loss that we experienced, but the life that those boys and that grandfather now receive in heaven. And the beauty of that moment when the people of God gathered in front of Farney Elementary School, we were enlightened of God's gifts. Then here on Friday morning, there was a funeral for one of the members of St. John, and uh, this was for Pastor Bob Myers. I don't know if any of you had the privilege of meet, meeting Pastor Bob uh, or talking with he or his wife, Barbara. But Pastor Bob actually joined St. John uh, when I was still full-time here. And they came into the 101 and the 201 class, and they came in as Bob and Barbara. And so you had to kind of pull out of him. Well, where are you coming from? Well, we, we've been in the Tomball area for a little bit, but we you know, actually came from Beaumont. Well, what did you do there? I, I worked there, and then I retired. No mention of, of the fact that he was a pastor, retired pastor. And that's actually to protect himself, because you know what happens to retired pastors? You don't retire. You get called in for things like this when the full-time pastors are out visiting family. And so he just wanted to be a member of a church. And so he spent a number of years here before, unfortunately, his mind and his brain did not work as well anymore, spending his last few years in memory care. But again, I had no intention of attending a, a funeral for a member of St. John last week, and yet that was where I found myself on Friday singing praises to God for the life of this man. And the beauty of this celebration was that we had a, a, a unique entrance down this aisle in the worship center. If you've been to funerals here at St. John, most often you'll hear a psalm as we're walking the casket down and the pallbearers are walking it down. And you'll hear a psalm, and generally it's Psalm 23. Now, you may know Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Again, focusing on that shepherd, caring for the sheep. And for some, this is a, a psalm of great comfort. For others, it's actually a psalm that it's very difficult because you often hear it at funerals. Well, that's not at all what we said at Pastor Bob's funeral. As his casket was being rolled down, this aisle here. This is what we said from the book of Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I have heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who has seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. A beautiful description of what God had been doing in Bob's life, what God does in our lives, and now 
our brother in Christ, Bob, who was anointed by the Holy Spirit, not only in baptism, but also as a pastor, ordained into the ministry, receive this same gift that we receive when we see our Lord face to face, that we will be made new. And so when we gather, and when we realize that God has enlightened us with his gifts, know this. He gives these fully to us. We don't gather in vain. We don't gather only to mourn. We don't gather only uh, to, to spend some time together and pat each other on the back and say, well, we hope to see you next week. We gather because God has called us into one family built on the foundation of Christ Jesus as the cornerstone, built as the sheepfold, as the shepherd has called us his sheep. We are one together with Christ. What a beautiful celebration that we will have again when we are made new in the days to come. Brothers and sisters, you have been anointed. You have been anointed by the Holy Spirit for what God has in store for you. What a joy this is that we share in this together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have called us, you have gathered us, you have enlightened us with your gifts, and we are thankful that you have called us one. We rely on each other, we trust in each other just as we trust in you. And we celebrate, we live, we share, and we serve each other. Father, send us from this place. Send us as ones who have hope and a future. Send us as ones who have been anointed by this calling so that we would go not in the power of ourselves, but in the power of your Son, Jesus, and in the Holy Spirit. Amen.